In my main series of videos, I've been talking about the development of an operating system, or as I called it in the first episode of that series, an operative system. I'm still getting comments about that, by the way. You should try talking in my shoes for one mile, I think you know what I meant to mean. The operating system is called Redacted OS and it's meant to run on ARM processors. But of course, as I've been building it, I've noticed several places in which things could go wrong in the system, and it's not particularly difficult to just crash the system. But today I decided to do something a little bit more exciting than that, and not just crash the system, but rather exploit it. So I wrote the first malware for my operating system. Getting ahead of the hackers on this one. Now before I begin talking about this, I want to make a few things clear. First off, this no longer works. It really only worked under some very specific conditions that I'm not actually sure how it ever worked, but we'll talk about it when we get to it. But most importantly, I fixed the issue that caused this, even though there's probably some others. And uh, second, because it no longer works, everything that I'm doing here is just a simulated version of the exploit that I wrote and uh, the things that I did with it. None of it is really real. Even when I started doing this presentation and I tried to exploit the system and recreate this, even getting rid of the safeguards that I installed in order to get rid of this exploit, I couldn't actually recreate it. So everything here is simulated. Okay, so what exactly did I do? Well. First off, let's start with an easy one. You can have user processes, and as a matter of fact, right now processes, they can just return their code, and after they're done executing their own code, the system doesn't really know what to do anymore, and it just crashes. So that's a pretty easy way to just crash the entire system, just uh, create an exploit that just does nothing. It's not very interesting, but technically it works. Obviously, this was somewhat easy to fix, Essentially, when we receive an exception because we've actually gone outside of the bounds of the program, then we just print out the fact that the process has crashed and just stop the process. And then now, as a matter of fact, user processes can crash without crashing the entire system, which used to be a problem. But again, that's boring. That's not quite the exploit that we're here to talk about. So let's get to it. In the main series, I talked about memory protection. You can have processes and the kernel all in memory, but if a process tries to, for example, access kernel memory, we have the MMU to protect the kernel and prevent this from happening. But what if we could get around this? Well, as it turns out, I found a way that we can. So inside the kernel, there's a bunch of stuff, not just code. There's also data in a temporary allocator, which I also talked about in one of my videos. Now, let's take a closer look at the temporary allocator. The thing about it is it contains a bunch of important or non-important temporary data that the kernel is using. So it just so happens to, for example, contain a frame buffer for the GPU, which is where we draw pixels that then get drawn onto the screen, and also the MMU tables that power the MMU that I talked about before. So you can probably already tell what the exploit is going to be. This is actually quite a popular type of exploit. So Obviously, to draw to the screen, we need to have some sort of draw pixel function, right? And this draw pixel function just draws to the frame buffer to the specific pixel that you've specified inside of the frame buffer, and it makes sure that you don't accidentally write past the frame buffer by putting a simple check. The problem, of course, is that this check wasn't always there. And so if we find a way to write past the frame buffer, we can actually write to the MMU tables and overwrite them. So this is pretty easy to do. All you have to do is just draw to a pixel that doesn't really exist way outside of the real bounds of the screen. And eventually you will hit the MMU tables and just write whatever you want to them. Now, this still leaves us with a lot of things that we don't know. Which pixel should we write to and what data should we write to it? Well, really, I could have just uh, dug around a little bit and found an exploit to read the MMU table data, and that way I would have been able to dynamically find this, but I didn't do any of that, I just used GDB. I found where the MMU tables were and what they looked like, and that way I knew exactly where I had to write and what I had to do to overwrite them. But let's go over it. This is an example of an entry into the MMU table. This defines kernel memory as protected memory. Now, it's a little bit hard to see in hexadecimal, so let's look at it in binary. It's a lot longer, but we can actually understand what's happening here. These are the bits that we care about. Everything else is kind of irrelevant for the time being. Specifically, the first one is the valid entry. This simply indicates that this is a valid MMU entry. The MMU will not look at it unless this is set to 1. Then we have the address. This simply indicates 
which physical address in memory this entry maps. And then these two bits over here actually indicate the read and write access permissions. If we find 00, zero this is equivalent to say that the kernel can read and write, but the user, or our process, cannot really do anything. But if we were to change that to 01, then both the kernel and the process is able to read and write that data. This means that a process that draws to a pixel that doesn't really exist outside of the frame buffer can override the MMU tables and give itself read and write access to kernel data and code. And by just changing that one bit, well, we defeat the MMU. There's not really a point to it anymore if we can just read and write any data that we want. Now, everything that I'm talking about here is, like I said, hard-coded. Really, I created this exploit when I kind of realized that this is a thing that could happen. As I was rewriting some GPU code, I realized that this was an issue. And so I quickly wrote this hard-coded exploit to see if it worked, and it kind of did. Although we will see why I didn't expect it to work in a little bit. But again, a more advanced version of it could have possibly found an exploit to read outside of the frame buffer, to read the MMU data and dynamically change it, instead of just hard coding everything and using GDB like I did. Now, let's actually take a closer look at this. I've mentioned the valid entry bit, the read and write access bits, the address bits. There's a few more that we're kind of ignoring right now, but I want us to focus on this bit right here. This one is unprivileged execute never. If this is set to one, it means that unprivileged code, such as our exploit, cannot execute whatever code is mapped here. But this is set to a zero, which means that our processes can just call kernel functions and execute their code with absolutely no restrictions. So <laughs> we can just call any kernel function that we want. Okay, maybe there are some restrictions, but still, this is pretty big. And the fact that I didn't even notice this at first, I only noticed it when I tried to replicate the original exploit while I was working on this video. The funniest thing about it is I actually wrote a comment that says, for now we make this not executable, but we actually do not make it not executable, so I don't even know what that comment was about. Now, there is one big restriction, and it's the fact that we cannot do the exploit that we've just talked about, giving ourselves read and write access in unprivileged mode, for vector tables or device code. That means the things that we have mapped as being the vector tables that we use to handle exceptions, and the things that we have mapped as device code, such as the code that we use to communicate with our GPU or our input system, cannot be mapped to be accessed by unprivileged code. This actually causes an exception. So we have to be careful with the mappings that we do. And this is why I said I'm surprised that this ever worked, because the vector tables were mapped with the kernel code. And so I'm kind of surprised that this didn't lead to an exception while I was first writing the exploit, but it definitely did cause issues when I tried to replicate the exploit for making this video, which is why I'm saying that everything I'm talking about here is a recreation and a simulation, because I wasn't really able to redo the exploit a second time. Now, let's look at what this actually looks like. Well, all we have to do, really, is... I mentioned before that we don't have any way of reading the MMU data, so we can just override it in very specific ways. So we kind of have to hard code it. But we know what that data looks like, and so we can just completely recreate it, but with the permissions that we want. And we also know exactly where to find that data. This never changes in the system. So we just need to calculate the specific X and Y pixel addresses that will allow us to write past the frame buffer and into the MMU data. And then we have to hard code what the data is going to look like. Again, we don't have a way to read it, but we do have a way of calculating it manually and just overwriting it blindly. So then it's pretty simple. We just have the pixels that we calculated, the mapping values that we have hard coded, we calculate them so that we can override all the mappings that are done for kernel code, and then we just call the function that writes to the frame buffer. And of course, because the function is a syscall, it happens in privileged mode. Even though we don't do it directly from the process, we instead ask the kernel to do it for us, it doesn't change the fact that we're asking the kernel to write past the frame buffer, and the kernel has no way of checking that. Well, it does now, but it didn't back then. And I mentioned before, we have the unprivileged execute never set to zero, which means we can call any kernel function we want with absolutely no restrictions. And there's actually a create kernel process function. This one is responsible for taking 
a place in memory and creating a new process that will execute the code found in that place in memory with privileges because it is a kernel process. So if we call this function and pass our own code, then we can create a kernel process from a user level process. And then that one will have completely unrestricted access to the system because it will be part of the kernel, even though it is actually part of an exploit. I was going to say it could be written by a malicious third party, but actually, no, it's still written by me. I wrote both the kernel and the exploit. This is how we can do this. Now, it's not as easy as just calling the function itself. We have to use assembly. The reason for this is we don't have access to the function itself in order to call it, but we can know where that function is in memory and just call it directly. So what we're going to do here is pass the arguments that the function expects. First off, we're going to pass a name for the process. In this case, we're writing exploit. Then we have passed the second argument, which is the pointer to the code that is going to be executed privileged. And this is some function that we've written as part of the exploit. This is actually written in C. Then we just have to load the address that we're going to be jumping to for the create kernel process, which we can get from GDB, and then just jump to it. And finally, we actually end the execution of the current process because the exploit is technically done. It will now be running its privileged code in a separate process called exploit. So this is what the normal code looked like. And uh, to be honest, I've seen that a lot of proof of concept exploits usually open the calculator in the operating system that they're exploiting just to show that they have access to it. But we don't have a calculator in this system. So I just changed it to be evil. And if we see this, it means that our exploit is now running in privileged mode. And if it wants to, it can completely take over the system. Now, there are actually some other things we could try, which honestly, I do kind of want to keep doing this, but it is a very resource intensive thing. Even if the operating system is open source and you can find the code directly, and even if you're me and I wrote the thing, it can be quite time consuming to find a way to exploit the system. I got really lucky with the frame buffer thing in that I kind of already knew that it could be done. And one day I just decided to do it. And I realized that, yes, it could very much be done. But even then, it took me maybe a couple days to write the exploit code. But if we wanted to, we could do some other things with these exploits that we've talked about. For example, we can overwrite the context switching code to give ourselves privilege. And I've talked about context switching in another one of my videos. And in it, I mentioned that there is a register called the SBSR, which indicates the privileged level of the process that we're switching to. If we find a way to overwrite that and then trigger a syscall so that context switching happens, or even wait for context switching to happen naturally when we switch between processes, then when we return to our process, we will be in privileged mode. We could also just call kernel functions directly like we did before with the create kernel process, because like I said before, we were not protecting any kernel code from being executed in unprivileged mode. Now, there are actually some memory protections. Some CPU registers cannot be accessed by unprivileged code, even if UXN is set to zero. And device memory cannot be accessed by unprivileged code. So there are some restrictions to what code we could actually execute. And for example, in the create kernel process function, there's actually some code that we had to skip past because we wouldn't have been able to actually execute that in unprivileged mode because the CPU wouldn't have allowed us. It has nothing to do with the MMU. We can also just access and modify another process's data with absolutely no restriction. This is actually not something that it's fixed. And I've mentioned it plenty of times before in my videos. Currently, all unprivileged code has access to all unprivileged memory and there's no restrictions to prevent a process from accessing data from another process, as long as both processes are unprivileged. Now, the way that the system is set up, there can only really be one unprivileged process running at the same time, or maybe not necessarily with exploits like the one I mentioned, we could have multiple processes, but this isn't too much of a problem, but it is something that I probably want to look into in the future. Now, I talked about this before already, but let's mention it again, why this will not work anymore. First off, it's the two megabyte granularity. Now, when I talked about the MMU, I talked about granularity. You can map things at four kilobytes granularity, where each entry in the MMU represents four kilobytes of data. But you can actually map at higher granularities than that. And our kernel code is actually mapped at two megabyte granularity. And two megabytes 
is actually quite a lot. It contains all my kernel code and also the vector tables. And if you remember, I said that vector tables cannot be mapped to be read or written by unprivileged code. If you do that, it will trigger an exception, which means that if we try to override the MMU mappings where the kernel code is, we are also overriding the mappings where the vector tables are. And like I said before, this will trigger an exception. We cannot map the vector tables to be readable or writable by unprivileged code. So really, it just begs the question of how did this ever work in the first place? But I guess back when it did work the first time I did it, things were mapped differently. So it worked back then, but even when I tried to recreate it for this video, I wasn't able to. And obviously, now that I found those two exploits for drawing to pixels and the UXN issue, I've fixed them. So those two particular exploits are fixed now. But the truth is, there's probably plenty more exploits. Like I said, it is quite time consuming to find them, even if you're the person who wrote the code, even if at some points while I was writing the code, I was thinking, maybe this could be exploited. Actually finding a way to exploit it is quite time consuming and I'm actually a little bit too busy writing the code for the operating system to stop and think of how to exploit it. So it is something that I wanna do more in the future, but it's definitely not my main priority right now. Now, this has been a little bit of a different video. Instead of talking about the operating system development, I am talking about how to take over the operating system and actually destroy it from the inside out. Okay, maybe not that much, but definitely how to make it do things that it's not really supposed to do and how to take over the system from a user process. Let me know if you enjoyed this and I hopefully will have more videos on operating system development coming up next week.